Carbon capture was supposed to be the answer, a way to get carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. But fast forward 10 years and some carbon capture plants were actually emitting more carbon than they capture. So what went wrong? And does this technology actually still make sense? So in this episode, we're going to get to the heart of what it is, how it works, and what the data is telling us. I'm Ricky, and this is 2 Bit Vinci. This video is brought to you by the Anchor Solix F3800 Plus. Who wouldn't want a get-out-of-jail-free card, a silver bullet? That's what carbon capture was sold as. A way to keep the engines going, the smoke puffing, and the oil flowing without setting the planet on fire. Sounds like sci-fi. And it turns out, it almost is. The U.S. has spent over $12 billion on carbon capture projects since the early 2000s. The bipartisan infrastructure law allocated $3.5 billion for regional carbon capture hubs. The Department of Energy announced $3.7 billion for large-scale carbon capture demonstrations in 2023 alone. And the private sector is just as eager to put money into carbon capture projects. For example, in 2023, venture capital firms injected $17.7 billion in carbon capture tech startups. The goal? To prove that carbon can be sucked out of the air, undoing the damage we've caused or are about to cause to our atmosphere. At its core, the principles of carbon capture are simple, and it makes a lot of sense. If the problem is that we're pumping too much carbon dioxide into the air, why don't we just remove it from the air or stop new CO2 from ever reaching it? While that's what carbon capture and storage, CCS, stands for, many companies inject that CO2 into the earth to displace oil for extraction. Such plants are known as carbon capture, utilization, and storage, or CCUS. But the devil and the money is in the details. So let's start with how carbon capture is supposed to work before we try to understand why it hasn't worked out, and if it ever actually will. Most carbon capture systems can be put into one of three categories. Pre-combustion, remove carbon before burning the fuel. Post-combustion, CO2 is stripped from the exhaust gases after burning the fuel, but before the exhaust reaches the air. And three, direct air capture. CO2 is pulled straight from ambient air. The last one, direct air capture, is the media's darling. If you've ever heard of a multi-million dollar carbon capture project, odds are it's a DAC plant. Plants like Climeworks, Mammoth, and Orca in Iceland are already operational. These suck air through huge fans, bind CO2 to a filter, and inject CO2 underground after extracting it from the filter using thermal desorption. Sounds pretty great, right? Well, it really does, until you look at the numbers. Climeworks Orca, which was until recently the largest in the world, captures 4,000 tons of CO2 annually. Its big sister, Climeworks Mammoth Plant, started operations in 2024 and is now the largest carbon capture plant in the world. It has a nameplate capacity of 36,000 tons of captured CO2 annually. So then you're probably thinking, if it's the largest in the world, it must be a big deal. So let's see how much of our problem it would solve. Humanity emitted an estimated 41.6 billion tons of CO2 in 2024 alone, up 2.5% from 2023. 90% of that? 37.4 37.4 billion tons came from burning fossil fuels. Now, we don't have to capture all of that because nature already does a lot of the work for us. Check out this graph on the global carbon cycle for 2023. The gray and orange arrows pointing up represent our carbon emissions, while the downward arrow represents natural carbon sinks. Notice that land and ocean uptake already capture 56% of our emissions, so we would only have to tackle the other 44%, which is 16.64 billion tons of CO2. And how much can Climeworks Mammoth and Orca plants capture in a year? 40,000 tons. That's a tiny 0.00024% of global emissions. We would need almost half a million mammoth plants to offset one year of CO2 emissions. On top of that, while the U.S. National Academy of Sciences estimates that the cost of direct air capture at $100 to $600 per ton of CO2, other sources put it closer to $1,000 per ton. That's $17 trillion a year to reach net zero globally in operational cost alone. As it is now, it's a financial black hole, especially when there are solutions which can absorb CO2 at $10 to $100 per ton. Extreme weather has been on the rise, and it's why research into these topics is so important. From wildfires in California, hurricanes in Florida, or new super tornadoes touching down in places they never did before, everyone should have an emergency plan. That's why you'll love our sponsor this week, Anchor and this, the Anchor Solix F3800+. 
This isn't just a portable power station. It's a complete energy independent solution. With 3.8 kilowatt hours of energy storage, you can power those critical appliances for hours, even if the power goes out. For those really long power outages, you can recharge from up to 3,200 watts of solar input, which is huge, or connect it directly to a fuel generator. This can help minimize generator runtime, conserve fuel, and with its exceptional build quality and wheels, you can roll the F3800 Plus to exactly where you need it indoors, something you can't do with a generator. Its dual voltage AC output supports 120 and 240 volt with 6,000 watts of power output to power the really big stuff. Start with one and expand over time, up to 53.8 kilowatt hours of energy storage for your entire house. Anchor Solix Prime Day 2025 is coming, so check out my links in the description to get exclusive benefits and flash sale product information. Huge thanks to Anchor Solix and you. Now back to the show. But then I dug a little bit deeper and I found out that it's not just a financial black hole. It's also an energy black hole. Current technology requires one to two megawatt hours of energy to capture one ton of CO2. So you're probably thinking, how much carbon would generating one to two megawatt hours of electricity produce if we use fossil fuels? And this is what I found. Natural gas combined cycle plants, the most efficient at converting fossil fuels into electricity, emit around 0.35 tons of CO2 per megawatt hour. So you would produce 3.5 to 7 tons of CO2 to capture one ton of CO2 in the best case. For comparison, an ultra supercritical coal plant, the most efficient type, emits around 750 to 850 kilograms of CO2 per megawatt hour. So you're looking at producing 0.75 to 1.75 tons of carbon to capture one ton of carbon. Carbon capture definitely won't clean up coal, not by a long shot. And even if you use natural gas plants, you'd need almost twice the installed capacity of carbon capture plants, roughly a million mammoths, to make up for the extra 35 to 75% of carbon you'd produce to power them. And this is the first problem. Unless you power these exclusively with nuclear or other carbon-free energy sources like wind and solar, the energy requirements alone make the entire carbon capture concept hard to swallow. And don't forget, we live in an era where we're about to see electricity demand skyrocket because of AI, for example, and many, many more data centers. So the last thing we need is another huge energy sink. But that's not even the least of the problems behind carbon capture. Consider Chevron's Gorgon project in Australia. It cost around $2 billion and was supposed to capture 4 million tons of CO2 annually. It missed its target by close to 50% in 2021 and 2022. The project had to purchase carbon offset to make up for the shortfall. And things haven't improved since. The following year, it only reached 30% of its target and had to pay $3.2 billion in carbon offset fees in 2023. The cost per ton of CO2 was initially estimated to be $70, but the underutilization increased the cost to $200, almost three times more, which means there are much cheaper alternatives available to absorb CO2. The Petronova carbon capture project is another example of throwing billions at a problem with nothing to show for it. It was America's flagship carbon capture and storage project that came online in 2017. The $1 billion project even won a $190 million U.S. Department of Energy grant. The goal was to capture 1.4 million metric tons of CO2 annually from their WA Parish coal-fired power plant. But here's what actually happened. The CO2 captured was piped 80 miles away for enhanced oil recovery to extract more fossil fuels. Quite the contradiction. The plant was shut down just three years later because of economic challenges missing the CO2 capture targets multiple times. The plant was restarted in September 2023 when oil rose to $80 per barrel, which made enhanced oil recovery profitable again. I could go on and on, but instead we put a couple of highlights together in this table. I mean, just look at this. All these plants consistently fell 50% or more under their target. And this one right here, this $6.7 billion project never even went online. This paints a pretty dark picture with only a few highlights, like these three, which are the only ones performing close to their stated capacity. So then, what makes these three plants different? One thing that all three have in common is that they're generally lower capacity than the others. So is scalability the issue for CCS projects? We'll get back to that later. First, a little food for thought. After 25 years and almost $80 billion invested globally, we only have 45 working carbon capture plants to show for it. And of those 45, only three are performing anywhere close to how they should. The rest are en route to failure. 
and 90% of the proposed carbon capture projects in the power sector never went live or were shut down prematurely. And there's something that we should probably touch on here. Many of these projects are financed by big oil. And you know as well as I do that oil companies don't like just losing billions of dollars each year on a technology that doesn't work. So what's their end game then? Let's look at some of these key problems with carbon capture. Let's start with the claimed theory that it's good for the planet and it'll make a difference. Well, that doesn't appear to be the case. Statista puts the share of annual CO2 emissions captured by CCS at just 0.12% in 2024. Imagine spending $12 billion on something and not being able to make even a dent of 1%. Okay, but maybe it'll pick up in the future. Well, again, the numbers say probably not. The latest report from the DNV paints the picture for the next 25 years. As things are going, we'll only be able to capture 6% of emissions by 2050 if we manage to lower global emissions from the current 41 billion tons per year by 50%. And that's a big if. If we don't, then carbon capture will only cover 3%. We're spending billions in upfront capital cost, trillions in operational cost to hardly make a dent in our carbon emissions. So how does this make any sense? It normally makes sense to follow the money. So maybe they're selling the carbon credits and making billions that way. No, that's not the case either. The most successful CCS plant in Europe spent on average $198 for every ton of captured carbon, twice the initial forecast of $105 per ton. Capturing it directly from a power plant is cheaper at $50 to $120 instead. However, carbon credits in Europe are only around 60 to 80 euros, about 70 to $93. And in the U.S., the 45Q tax credit gives $85 per ton, which is almost always lower than the cost. This makes most of these plants completely commercially and economically unviable, unless they do something with the carbon that adds value, which is exactly where the key lies. But before we get into that, I want to talk about my largest problem with carbon capture. It's kind of like this magical diet pill. If Somebody on the TV came out and said, eat this and you'll lose weight. The problem with that is it'll build bad habits. You'll probably eat less healthy, maybe not even exercise, and hope that this miracle pill will take care of everything. This is kind of the economic climate equivalent of that. This tells people, oh, don't worry, I can just keep driving my gas car. We can keep using coal and natural gas power plants because we can just capture the carbon out of the air instead of investing actually in meaningful new technologies that are cleaner from the start. Going back to the diet example, everybody probably knows that there is no replacement for eating healthier, eating less, and exercise. Those are tried and true age-old methods of being healthier. And whatever pill we come up with, isn't going to replace that. And this also explains why it's oil companies that are investing in this, because if they could find a way to keep doing what they're doing, they'd want to. We've hinted at this already, but there's an even darker side to carbon capture. Most of the captured carbon is used to pump out more carbon in the form of oil through a technique called enhanced oil recovery, or EOR. EOR uses compressed carbon dioxide by injecting it into oil wells, pushing out the deepest crude that can't be easily extracted by traditional drilling. The result? You exchange CO2 for more carbon in the form of oil from the well. How much more? Well, one ton of compressed CO2 can extract two and a half to three barrels of crude oil. At 0.43 tons of CO2 per barrel, this results in 1 to 1.18 tons of fresh CO2 emissions that are waiting to happen. Even if 100% of the CO2 stays in the well, that's a net 18% more CO2 in the atmosphere from every ton of carbon captured. While this makes sense for oil companies because now they have a product to sell, the value additive component we talked about earlier, it doesn't make sense from a carbon capture perspective. Remember earlier when I mentioned that the only plants that can be remotely called successful are the smaller ones, around one megaton of CO2 per year? That indicates that the scalability is an issue. And that kind of makes sense. These systems sit in place sucking in air and air does circulate naturally but as you're sucking in air you're probably sucking in the same air over and over at some point which means that the fans and the system is just recirculating the same cleaned air it's not like we can put these in the sky or have big fans above them to blow fresh air we have to rely on natural convection from the natural winds on earth and that doesn't bode well for the technology even further because Building at scale is how you bring the cost down. So if you have to have 
thousands or millions of smaller systems all over the world, it becomes an impossible nightmare to try to get licensing and permitting and agreements from different governments to try to make this happen. Now, there's probably an easier way to make this happen at the site of natural gas and coal-fired power plants, where the CO2 concentration is much higher, there's probably an easier way to make that happen, and maybe that makes sense. But I think the failure of carbon capture actually illustrates just how important circularity is. Here's what I mean by that. I think what this will show us is the next time a natural gas power plant is proposed, we should tell them, okay, factor the cost of the natural gas power plant and then the carbon capture system to offset that credit and then the energy needed to power it, compare that all together in its totality against something like wind or solar or nuclear, which have none of those drawbacks. Remarkably, the unintended consequence of actually going through the process of building these carbon capture plants is that it has showed us just how difficult it will be to live in an economy and a future with fossil fuels. Probably not the intent the oil companies were after, but I think this shows us that we cannot rely on the magic diet pill. We have to do what we know is right. We have to try our best to move to newer technologies that are cleaner. I made a video recently about my four years into my fully net zero house, where we power our house, our business, and our two electric cars entirely from solar and stored in batteries, and we're about 98% completely self-reliant. It is possible, and there's probably a lot we can learn from that. So like our parents probably told us, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. This can't be a replacement or a answer to doing the wrong things and building bad incentives. I think as an engineer, I am glad that they tried this to at least see if it was possible, but realizing how much energy these things take really surprised me. I thought it would actually be pretty low energy in terms of output. I thought the cost and the capital upfront raise required would be the big challenge. But realizing now just what is happening, I think we can say that this is not going to be the answer that we're looking for. Don't forget to like and subscribe. A lot of you guys watch our videos and don't subscribe. We'd love it if you hit that subscribe button. And until next week, I'm Ricky of Tuba Da Vinci. Thank you so much for watching.